kid. Seriously. Welcome to a reflective episode of the Kids Seriously Show. We're the only podcast around. Took a week off, thought about things, evaluated the ins, the outs, the what have yous, and came back stronger. Every now and again, we get together to discuss the news, play our award winning trivia question, and answer some of your questions, and also discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy. To my left, it's the man who has a healthy relationship with his mirror. It's Luke Neitzel, and to my right, way to my right, it is the return of Portland's own Mark Neitzel. Gentlemen, how are you? Well, why doesn't Mark start since his life is more exciting than the rest of ours right now? Yeah, it really doesn't feel exciting. I'm unpacking boxes and I'm dealing with smashed car windows. And I don't know where anything in this town is. And it rains all the time. Like, all the time. You sound like a pampered Californian is what you sound like. Well, I, I am. I am indeed. So have any, yeah, and, and, any of the natives of Oregon talks about how you're ruining their their town by moving from California and driving yeah, their prices no, up? Fortunately, so far, I've only really run into California transplants. Oh, perfect. Yes. So I'm, I'm actually thinking of um, once we get a house uh, purchased, actually trying to create a little California neighborhood. Nice. In- I thought it, I thought it basically was a little California neighborhood, and the the people from Oregon were trying to make a little Oregon neighborhood. <laughs> in there. Well, it kind of, but I, I really want to, you know, cement the name in there, and make them really come to grips with the fact that they've got a little California in Portland. Perfect. We'll just fly that Quakes flag and make them jealous. Mm-hmm. What is the beard ratio? Just out of curiosity, have you done a statistical survey of beards? Yes, the beard ratio in Portland. I, I've always imagined it was very high. We're picturing everyone looking like Nat Borchers. Oh, um, no, no. I, I would say that I have one of the healthier beards that I've encountered so far. It's a lot more tattoos, though. Way mm-hmm. more tattoos than I was expecting. What that's, about? That's the real big thing here. What about mustache wax? Is there like a high mustache wax ratio? No, oh. no. No, I'm a little disappointed. I'm as disappointed as you are when you found out that it rains a lot in Portland. <laughs> yes, well, you know, you think you, you, I knew it rained a lot, and I, I was preparing myself. And you think about it, and you're like, oh, okay, there'll be a lot of rain, but you know, you'll get by. And then you're here, and it's raining on you constantly, and you realize you didn't really understand it. I mean, you, you had a grasp of it on an intellectual level, but on a real emotional sort of feeling at level, you, you don't really get it until you're here and until your socks are constantly wet because the dog has to go out five times a day. Yeah, yeah, and especially when your socks are made of ivory like yours, like, they don't absorb as well, and it's it's hard to move around. <laughs> no, 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 no. Silk and Egyptian cotton. It's true, it's true. Um, I'm fine. I, I'm getting over my Halloween hangover. It was a glorious month. I got to use up my unwanted vacation days and go to movies and decorate my lawn and do all the fun stuff I like to do. And now it's November and it's about to get dark at four o'clock every day and uh, get cold and I have to rake leaves. Uh, November's the worst. That's the conclusion I, I come to at the start of this week every year. So that's how I'm doing. How are you, Maya? I'm fine. Oh, nice. Um, I, I wanted to play a new game because I noticed this during, well, every podcast we've ever done yeah. going back almost a year now. And definitely I noticed it in my update is uh, every time I invent a word that's not really a word while I'm talking, everyone has to drink. So I think I said that your job was intensified or something intensively or I, I used something wrong in it last time. So everyone get your beverages ready because right. I'm going to make up words tonight. All right. What are we drinking? I have wine, and Maya has, uh, what is that, grapefruit sparkling is, is, water? Is Clarbrun one of our sponsors? It could be. All right. I'm drinking Clarbrun Natural Source Sparkling Water. It's got zero calories and is also sodium-free, and it's delicious. Nice. What, what about you out there, Portland man? Well, in order to fully ingratiate myself and, and prepare for the uh, upcoming playoff game I'm attending tomorrow, I am drinking a Widmere Brothers Hefe. 
which is the official craft beer of the Portland Timbers. Nice. And the, the people out there in podcast land can't see it, but there is a nice little Timbers logo right there on the label. Nice. So in dealing with, with crossing the dark side and becoming a Timbers fan, would you say you're like episode two Anakin, or are you like full-fledged episode three Anakin? Like how I, far along the I, dark side are you? I never want to be episode two Anakin under any circumstances. You'll always be episode two Anakin life. to me where... Okay. You know, and I was going to say that that story was pretty familiar to me because I had a similar experience when I moved to Wisconsin. I, I went out right away and got a shot of Provacilic Insulin, which is the official insulin of the Milwaukee Brewers. And that was what really made me feel like I fit in here in Wisconsin. So I get I get where you're coming from. Wisconsin. Diabetes and beer. Mm-hmm. Sounds like we got empathy flowing here in today's episode. You know who really likes empathy? It's Brad Scavello. And what else Brad Scavello really likes is our favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? And he- am I right? Am I wrong? Or am I just dreaming? You're wrong. Here's how our play or our game works. So there's going to be like seven questions. We go back and forth in a serpentine fantasy football draft sort of way. Uh, the winner is the one who gets four questions right. There's no overtime. You got to win it in regulation tonight. It's going to be a non-title bout between myself and Mark. So I'm going to let Luke take it from here. Thank you, Maya. I have created seven glorious questions. One is a question I'm the most excited to have ever seen and it's actually not even a great question it's just the story was so amazing that i had to forge a question around it because it's that good so we'll get to that one a little later but we're gonna start out today and climax pretty much who goes first uh maya is gonna go first so here we go i am the higher ranked if i'm not mistaken sure maya's higher ranked so we will go with Maya to start out with, and we're going to hit the current box office where Bohemian Rhapsody is declaring itself the champion. Get it? Uh-huh. Get it? I did that. This wasn't the part that you were so proud of? No, this is not the part okay. I'm proud of. So the movie chronicles the genius of Queen frontman Freddie Mercury, and it came out this weekend. It's going to win the box office. It's had lukewarm reaction from critics who claim it's a pretty watered down version of a true story where the surviving band members have made sure that their homophobic reactions to Mercury coming out have been suppressed so that they all look happy and nice. But fans are definitely into it. It has a massive opening, it looks like. It's Saturday today, so we don't know the, f- the full numbers, but it's Thursday and Friday. We're great. So this had me thinking about bio- biographical movies, biopics. Gentlemen, starting with Mr. Maya, what's your favorite movie biography? I'm having trouble thinking. It's not a genre I like particularly well. This is what we call in the game stalling. So this would be, well, we're kind of looking for answers, cycling the puck here, trying to come up with something. My favorite biopic, I don't know, I like that one with Nelson Mandela with the rugby. Okay, Invictus? Invictus, yeah, I like that one I a lot. I saw that so recently. I actually uh, was in charge of a youth group um, at a uh, local social services center for, for – um, for low income kids and we showed that so and i really liked it but i'm not really big into the biopics sorry to disappoint off to a bed start we're gonna have faith in yourself mark all right well since you're running the questions i know the correct answer will not be lincoln so i'm that gonna steer true. clear hold on while i tell this folksy tale oh uh, <laughs> hey unimportant guy i'm gonna give you a 20 minute lecture before deciding the fate of the war i'm so exactly folksy. so i'm gonna go with um what I actually think is probably the greatest movie I've ever watched. Favorite is a little hard to say because it's so difficult to get through. And it's not something that I can sit down and watch repeatedly, but it's amazing. It's important. And given the current state of our country, it's pretty timely. So my pick is Schindler's list. The biopic of uh, Oscar Schindler. I'm going to go ahead and throw a penalty flag on this and see if I can get a review because I wouldn't call Schindler's List a biopic. It's about a moment in the man's life, not his full life. Uh, yeah, but you, you picked something that's really more about a sports tournament Damn than it's... it is a biography of an individual well, person. So I think and, you're... And, and can I just say something that if you're going to put some guy's entire life, the movie would be 50 some years long. All right. Well, Every biopic has you know... to pick and choose certain points in time. 
and it just so happened to pick the only important part of his life. Oh, I don't think his parents would agree with you there. I think his parents probably weren't great people, to be honest. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> anyway, I am going to give Mark the point. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I don't have a problem with either of your picks of those movies, because, again, it is kind of a, sh- you know, a, a weird area to go. What really makes it qualify as a biopic? Um, but... Schindler, they're both good movies. Schindler's List is a better movie. The correct answer, if you wanted to really nail it down, you know, what what I think really is makes a good biopic is in, is really getting to the root and the core of an individual person and how their genius works, which is um, why I picked this specific movie. Mark, I'm I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint, okay? And I want to see if you can you can figure this out. But um, I'd like you to do me a favor and go ahead and call Boris Karloff a cocksucker. Oh, oh, the answer was actually Ed Wood, the Tim Burton that classic quality, about the. That is a quality choice. Quality choice. But I'm going to give the point to Mark out of the answers given because I do believe that Schindler's List is a, a, a better movie. But I, I really actually do like your pick of Invictus. And uh, that wasn't one I thought of, but that that is a good, good movie. So question two, Mark, we're going to start with you. All right. On Friday, German magazine Der Spiegel. Published a report by Soccer Leaks that stated Bayern Munich was leading a charge to create a European Super League for soccer. This new league would replace the current Champions League and feature the likes of Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Manchester United, Manchester City, Arsenal, Liverpool, Juventus, Paris, Chelsea, and AC Milan. All these teams would be abandoning their current domestic leagues for the Super League, and the report went so far as to claim Bayern Munich had already found legal ground to leave the Bundesliga. Now, Munich is denying these reports and is actually threatening legal action against Der Spiegel! But, let's pretend this is true. My initial reaction to this report is that I hate it, and I'm an Arsenal fan, so my team would be in this league. Give me one good reason why I'm wrong to think this is a bad idea. Because it would destroy all the other domestic leagues in the other countries. I mean, it's already a problem that has been created by promotion relegation that you had super clubs and a bunch of minnows. Wait, wait, hold on. I'm supposed to tell you why you're wrong, right? You are. So you're off to a very confusing start. Okay. I'm going to tell you, so, well, no, I can't go the route of it's good for Arsenal because they would constantly get their asses kicked in that league, so that's not good for you. Um, I'm going to say no because Fox would probably get the TV rights and then we'd have Joe Buck and Dancing Robots. I can't do it. There is no good reason for this league. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Maya. Take the point. Luke, you once said that um, the reason that you like – the Super Bowl after the Pro Bowl, or I'm sorry, the Pro Bowl coming before the Super Bowl was because you wanted the uh, most competitive game and the most exciting game to be at the end. In this league, if it were to work out how Bayern Munich wants, it would be constantly great competition against constant great competition. Even the Champions League has a bunch of, you know, slap dicks early on in the uh, in the competition. So this is like high quality competition. But why I'd, re- I'd doubting the quality you- of Greek teams? What's that? Are you doubting the quality of Greek teams? I am. I am and also Swedish teams and Norwegian teams and I actually kind of like Norwegian teams. But anyways, um you- here's the other thing though, Luke, you can feel free to like this idea because much like the Superliga in the United States, nothing's going to come of it. Even if it does happen, it'll be like a two-year thing and then people will forget about it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is an ass-kicking, since Mark didn't even attempt to make an answer, and he insulted Arsenal in the middle of his non-answer. So we are going to give the point to to Maya. What I had written down was uh, something neither of you went with, though I do like your point, Maya, that it would be great competition, is it could make the domestic leagues more exciting. Because you look at Germany, in particular in the Bundesliga, and I watch a lot of Bundesliga now because my son is crazy insane for uh, Borussia Dortmund. And that league, if you look at the individual games, has exciting, thrilling games. It's awesome style of soccer. But the championship is never in doubt, even though this year it's looking better. But in most years, Bayern Munich's 
basically perfect most of the year and there's no drama to it. So the other leagues could actually get more exciting maybe if we take the mega teams away from them and that could make for more interesting soccer. And the attendance at these leagues, when you look at it, compared to what it was in the 60s and 70s, is actually much better. I mean, even with the minnows, like people are much more into their their teams nowadays, um, even the small ones. So, Yeah, but I don't have a faith in the uh, Europeans that if you do that, they're going to care about uh, the other leagues. So yeah. I think it's going to lead to the other leagues drying up. I mean, well, it's not going to because it's not going to happen. But it would have led to a, a significant downgrade in all of the leagues. You know, I, I think I think it would definitely hurt them, and it would hurt the TV contracts that you would see. But I, I don't think it's going to hurt attendance or anything like that. Like, too many of those places are too passionate about their, their teams to let that affect them. Like, I don't, you know... Uh, Leicester City is going to sell out regardless of whether they're playing Cardiff City or Manchester United. So I, I think it would still thrive. It would still be there. They would take the hit monetarily from the, the TV contracts. But, man, for me, I think it, it could make those leagues more exciting. So we are tied but after two. TV, TV is where the money's at. Yeah, but it's not going to kill them. Like, they're still going to exist. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> you lost the point. Give it up. All right. Question three, and this is going to start with Maya. So, guys, it's really happening, and it's getting real. The four Avatar sequels that no one has asked for are approaching. The BBC is even reporting that the names of the four new Avatar sequels have been released. Okay? (laughs) So pay attention when I read these out. Okay? So, we have the next one. Avatar, The Way of Water. Oh, God. Avatar... The Seed Bearer, Avatar, The Tolkien Rider, and Avatar, The Quest for Iwa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> the fourth one is The Quest? The fourth one is The Quest for Iwa. I would have thought Quest for Iwa was, you know, too out of the gate, but they're going to make you wait for it. Well, hey, that's, that's, that's just what like Superman, the Superman did. Yeah. series, though. Number four was The Quest for Wait, the seed bearer, and then what was the third one? Spell the, the third one the, for me. Is it the, the Tol- Tol- not like not like J.R. Okay, because like, like the seed bearer T- and the Tolkien. T U L K U N. Okay, so okay, so he just switched the spelling about it. He sure did. He liked the ocean a lot in the first one, so he made a movie. Wants to make a movie about the ocean, and then he's like, "Ah, fuck the rest of it." Tolkien and Quest for Peace are my. (laughs) And the the problem here is 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 shouldn't it instead of being the Tolkien writer, it should have been Avatar dances with Tolkien. But I don't know. Apparently, we didn't go that way. Awful. <laughs> so so these are our four and this isn't even the question I'm most excited for, by the way. Oh my god. So we're gonna play a hypothetical game here. <laughs> Both of you guys are living, and suddenly a portal opens and a time traveler steps through. This time traveler urgently expresses to you that you have the power to prevent the birth of Donald Trump. But in order to do that, you have to sit through the entirety of one of these four movies. Which one of these four Avatar movies that I'll read again are you picking as your Avatar movie to kill Donald Trump? Is it one, The Way of Water? Two, The Seed Bearer? Three, The Tolkien Rider? Or four, The Quest for Iwa? Maya, we start with you. Well, the seed bearer sounds like <laughs> like a pornography <laughs> film, so I'm kind of excited about that. But of course, I'm going to go for the quest for Iwa because that is that would be the final culmination of it all. It's named after one of the great pieces of American film, the Quest for Peace, and really, like you want to see how it all wraps up, right? No, I don't really want to see how it's <laughs> yeah, all wrapped up either, anyway. Right? But uh, Mark, do you need them reread to you? I, no, no, I'm going to go with number one, whatever that was called. The, the way of way water. The shape of water. Or, <laughs> I got the reason, that one too. Oh my God. <laughs> the, the reason I'm going with number one, the shape of water, is because as bad as these movies are, I don't want to come into the middle of a story and have to try and spend half of the movie figuring out what I didn't see already. So at least... With number one, I can come in. I they will. I'm assuming. Tell me what the story is. I'll I'll be introduced to the characters, and then I cannot care. As opposed to coming in at the end, where I've got to try and figure out what I've missed. So, number one, the shape of water. 
<laughs> well, guys, by rule of the game, first and foremost, I have to go with what's written down on the paper. So I'm just going to read what I wrote down on the paper because one of you did get the correct answer, though you both touched on it. It is movie four, The Quest for Iwa. The name is very close to the greatest superhero movie of all time, The Quest for Peace. <laughs> so the point goes to Maya. But let's all be excited for the return of Avatar in 2020. Oh, my gosh. Uh, on, on the plus side, it's preventing him from making other movies. That is true. That I don't have to see. That is very true. All right, guys. Maya is up by one. So, Mark, we're going to need you to dig deep here. The new television season is in full swing. And like every new year, there's treasured shows that get canceled unfairly and are no longer with us. One of the most baffling cancellations of all of last year, or maybe forever, was the laugh-a-minute genius of Kevin James in the hilarious sitcom, Kevin Can Wait. <laughs> but do not fret, loyal listeners. We live in an age of saved shows and reboots, and a hero has emerged for Kevin Can Wait. <laughs> Rashida Jones, the actress and writer known for The Office, Parks and Recreation, daughter of Quincy Jones, no. is working with AMC on not a direct relaunch because they don't have the rights, but a spiritual interpretation. I'm going to read this exactly as it is written. This is 100% real. The name of the show is called Kevin Can Fuck Himself. <laughs> From creator Valeria Armstrong and executive producer Rashida Jones and Will McCormick, the show explores the secret life of a woman we all grew up watching, the sitcom wife. A beautifully woman paired with a less attractive, dismissive, caveman-like husband who gets to be a jerk because she's a nag and he's, quote, funny. Our series looks to break television convention and ask... What does the world look like through her eyes? It'll al alternate between single camera realism and multi camera zaniness. The formats will be constantly informing one another as we ask what happens when the supporting character is presented as a real person, and what if that person is pissed off? It's clear that Rashida Jones is the hero we need, but not the one we deserve. If you could erase one fictional TV program from television history, what would it be? And we start this time with Mark. Hmm. One fictional TV series. Well, uh, my my gut instinct is to go with the Big Bang Theory because it's so awful. But that's also a little cliched. Um, everybody knows how terrible that show is, and the the so, number one comedy on TV. Yeah. Right. Yeah, in, in a country that elected Donald Trump president. So that means shit for all. But if I'm going to erase one particular show. Hmm. Maya, can you do a tap dance here while I think about this? I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you. The puck. Just cycle the puck. I'll, I'll tell you right now is that I have all this written down and I keep glancing over just that Kevin can fuck himself <laughs> written down. <laughs> and I'm trying not to laugh while everyone's talking. Um, Let's see. Fictional show that... The reason we went fictional is because obviously I'd say The O'Reilly Factor. So I had to make it be... Right. Not a you know a show like that. Then the thing. first person to talk would ever would just win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so this is keep the integrity of the sport. Exactly. Here. Right. Okay. I gotta go with a fictional show. I'm gonna say. You know what? I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say two and a half men because that was just as bad as the Big Bang Theory, but because that one was popular. We then got Chuck Lorre making all other kinds of shows and further polluting our airwaves. So that's a terrible show. That one. All right. Two and a half men is Mark's answer. We now turn it over to mine. I really want to go to Roseanne here. I want to go to Roseanne. But the truth is that I liked that show when I was younger. And so it wouldn't be right. I, I don't like it now, more mostly because of what happened recently. So I'm just going to go with my heart here and say Ultimate Spider-Man because that was the one that replaced the Spectacular Spider-Man, which I think was the greatest animated show of all time and only got one season um, when Disney took over um, 
the uh, the rights and then rebooted and all that stuff. So uh, for me, that that's the honest answer is like I hated that Ultimate Spider-Man show. So, so guys, I don't think this has ever happened in the history of this game. We had something really weird happen. One of you picked the correct answer written on paper, and one of you picked a show I've never heard of. So <laughs> the point is going to go to Mark because on paper, Two and a Half Men is written down for the reasons you talked about. <laughs> Two and a Half Men is, I would argue, while they're both horrible shows, it's even dumber, more misogynistic, crude, just total shit garbage. And it opened the door to the Big Bang Theory. And it also came at a time where we were starting to get the takeover of single camera sitcoms, which are always better than multicam sitcoms. And I think if we hadn't had Two and a Half Men, we might have gotten the the death knell of the multicam sitcom in most of its form. So Two and a Half Men is... Definitely it, though I don't doubt that that Spider-Man cartoon sucks. I didn't know it happened, so hard for me to give you the point on that. I just want to point out, just they for posterity, in the, in the true event that, um, you know how like Mark likes to be like the underground and like edgy and stuff like that? Let's not forget that the, the creators of Two and a Half Men and Big Bang Theory started off with Roseanne, so I just want to drop my mic on that. Cause... Yeah, but you didn't even pick that. Yeah, I know, because and... I was too cool for that, and I was being I think both of you guys just need to move on, because the game. Mark's insulting the original Spider-Man cartoon, which was awesome. Oh, yeah, that's great. And you're droning on about something. So, we're going to move to question oh, like, five. Like, nobody, like, neither of you guys drone on about stuff all the time? No, but I get to pick the points right now, so... Oh, that's right. I wield I the power. I have to decide who I want to be. Right? Woohoo! Tied at two to two, let's move to question five. And this is going to start with Maya. We're going to talk a little wrestling. Yeah. None of us really watch wrestling, but we did as kids, and we all have a certain amount of nostalgia for it. Yeah. The WWE recently held its controversial oh pay-per-view. God, crown, oh, my God. Crown Jewel. And the event is under fire because it was held in Saudi Arabia despite global outcry over the government murdering uh, reporter Jamal Khashoggi, which I'm sure I pronounced wrong. Uh but we, we aren't a political or current events show, so we're not going to dive into the ethics of that, because I'm sure we're all on the same page anyway. Um, we're going to just focus on the dumb things they do in the ring. Um, and the dumb thing they did in particular here is, is they staged a Crown Jewel event meant to be the World Cup-style tournament to determine the best wrestler. And in typical WWE fashion, they gave it to non-wrestler Shane McMahon. Mm-hmm. Now, Shane O'Mac. Shane O'Mac didn't technically win a championship belt in this tournament, but it's a terrible decision, and who is the worst person to ever win a championship in wrestling? Who goes first? Maya goes first on this one. The worst person? There, there's so many. Um, there is one that is far is Okay, so as bad as Hulk Hogan is, it's Chris Benoit. Understandable. We're going to go to Mark now. Okay. Chris oh, Benoit is no. a little bit revisionist, because everything he did up until the time that he murdered his wife and child it was pretty good. And I realize how horrible I am for saying that, but I'm, I'm sticking by it. No, the correct answer is Courtney Cox's husband, David Arquette winning the WCW title and basically killing the promotion, allowing the monopoly that is the WWE. So Maya actually gave me pause here because that never occurred to me, and I do think that is a, a really a really good answer. But the technical rules say I have to go with what's written on the paper. This is, this is embarrassing to both you. You made this game, and you are the one who said we have to go by what's on the paper. Yeah, and I, what's on the paper is is giving the championship David belt Arquette to David Arquette David just Arquette to promote over. Ready to Rumble in <laughs> theaters. Ben yeah, could have been Stanley Tucci right there, bitch. They, Sucked it. That, that is a very Stanley Tucci type answer. Mark, you've actually gone two for two on uh, getting correct answers on the paper, but uh, the Chris Benoit thing is oof. I, I guess I erased him from my 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 memory. Erase him from because, but still, they gave a championship belt to David Arquette. <laughs> so we are moving on to question six, which is going to start with Mark, who now has a three to two lead, which means that if he gets this one, he takes takes it all. So MLS playoffs have arrived, oh, God. and though the games have been pretty exciting, attendance in the first round has been slightly an issue. NYCFC hosted a game on Halloween night, which was also a Wednesday, and it was the lowest attended game in the history of their franchise. Meanwhile, that same Halloween night in Dallas, FC Dallas had an announced attendance of 10,000, but most guesses would put the actual butts in the seat at about 6,000 at best. A lot of people are blaming the current format for the attendance woes since they put these knockout first-round games on Wednesday nights. 
My question for you guys, and I'll read you the play mat, playoff format as it stands after I ask you the question, is how would you change the current format to make the MLS playoffs more exciting? The current format is six teams from each conference make the playoffs. The top two teams get buys. The first round is a one-game knockout round held on a Wednesday. The second round is two-game series on alternating weekends. The third round follows the same, and MLS Cup is a one-game <coughs> playoff. Maya, or no, Mark, I'm sorry. How would you change the playoffs to increase attendance and excitement? Oh, you do it just like the NFL, that it's knockout rounds every time with the higher-seeded team getting home field advantage. I think that clearly works for that format. I mean, I realize that the NFL is slightly bigger and more well-attended than MLS, but I think that that format is works. And so you also give the two top two seeded teams an extra week off, which is a reward for doing well in the season. And it also prevents what we have now which is this short turnaround for the lower seed teams where they have three days rest before they have to play again. So I would just do single elimination um, every weekend until you have a champion. Maya? That's a great answer, (coughs) and uh, one of the things that they should strongly consider. But I think when you're going to rob uh, those teams of a home game, the idea of this question and the idea that the league would want is for those uh, on those lower seats to also get a home game. I mean, that's how, you know, they want to make money as well. So I think the only way you can do that is to have more midweek games in the summer when kids are out of school and then have them just week by week um, to keep a similar format, but just draw out the playoffs a little bit more. It makes, you know, the, the summer a lot more congested. But at the end of the day, these are a lot of teams who didn't make money for a long time. And they're going to be looking for, uh, ways for the entire league to make money, not just the uh, the, the higher seeds. Could I, could I add a quick addendum to my answer, too? That you never have a playoff game in Frisco, Texas. <laughs> that would also help attendance issues a lot. I can guarantee you the league was very excited that D.C. got the home field advantage over Columbus, because that would have mm-hmm. been a very different turnaround if it was in Columbus. Um, this is this is crazy. These are good answers. Once again, I'm I'm bound by the paper. And the, the paper tells me that you make the whole thing single game knockouts. I am not a fan of the two game playoff series because nobody plays in the first game. They just sit back and wait for the, the second game. So I think those games are blah as well. Uh, plus the Wednesday games never really work out. So I am in favor of the single game knockout, which Mark correctly pointed out, which is going to give him the win. I do like Maya's answer. I do think they should play more summer weekday games uh, to, to make more time. But we're going to play question seven anyway, because it's 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 a really impactful question that I think is going to take a lot of heart and a lot of thought on your guys' part. So I think we need to, to hear what could happen here. So, I also want to run up the score on him. Sure. So question seven. All three of us are children of the 90s. We spent a lot of our teen years listening to 90s music and in Maya's case, playing in bands during the 90s. Now, we've all spent an impressive amount of time listening to that music. I recently got a a newer car and it has a free preview of XM and I have made the nineties on nine, one of my favorite channels. So I listened to that a lot and I had an amazing two song blitz where just incredible things were happening and we were going for the trifecta, but they blew it on the trifecta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list you the two songs that I heard and then I'm going to need you to pick a nineties song to complete the trifecta. All right. And we're going to start with Maya here. So, Song one, Whitney Houston's version of the Dolly Parton classic, I Will Always Love You. Song two, and was part of my inspiration for the Stefan Diggs audio in the update this last week, Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On. So after those two songs, they went into Date Rape by Sublime, which was kind of a different vibe. How would you finish that three song <coughs> trifecta? Well, I'd want to go upbeat, uh, so upbeat, so i go, uh, Paul Abdul, Opposites Attract. It's hard to argue with cartoon cats, but we are going to turn it over to Mark. Okay. So, I already know the artist. I'm just desperately trying to think of the right song, because I can only come up with one, and it's not 
one that really completely highlights her range. Um, hold on, I'm getting on my Google machine here, which might technically be a violation, but I've already won. So what do I care at this point, really? Um, this is not the first time that you've used uh, mechanical enhancements to try to get a victory or try to run up the score. But normally never wins, so it doesn't right. really matter <laughs> anyway. Right, so um, I'm, just, I'm just Googling right now discography so you all can just sit tight I'm sure while they, I'm I, um... sure most people have turned us off already we could just oh, look... okay. I was going to say we could talk it. more about Kevin can fuck himself while we wait <laughs> alright so you, you started out with Whitney Houston right you then went to Celine Dion who are two of the uh, biggest voices of the 90s and you've really got to finish it off with the third and so I'm going to do uh, Emotion by Mariah Carey the, the last trifecta of the big 90s voices. So there were two acceptable perfect answers to finish this trifecta. Um, and, and neither of you got them. Mark, you were closer, but you used Google, so you're not going to get the point. Nah. But the, the two acceptable answers are is is you went with the right artist, but you can't go mm-hmm. with emotions. I mean, we're, we're talking about songs Someday. about heartbreak. Someday. No, we're talking about songs about heartbreak oh. and loss. And sadness, which is why you need to go to Mariah Carey's soulful duet with Boys to Men <laughs> and One Sweet Day. Because they're all about losing stuff. But there was another route that didn't I even occur. Even that this didn't even occur to you guys. You guys, you know, you went the diva route. The other acceptable route was shitty 90s soundtracks. Okay? Because we're talking the bodyguard in Titanic. So the other acceptable answer would be from the classic 1993 version of the Three Musketeers, and the song "All." Saw for... that in the theater, so, and you would have then heard the song "All for Love," the trio of Brian Adams, Rod Stewart, and Sting. We've already apologized for Brian Adams. I'm not sure if Phil Collins was unavailable that day, <laughs> but they made a go of it, the three of them. So that answer was also acceptable. Mark used Google. Maya gets the point. But Mark wins the day four to three, which means Sunshine we now, for the first time ever, get Mark's 30 seconds of glory. Fuck you. Or, 20, music. Or, or 20 seconds of glory, either one. Luke. Hey, what? Hey, Mark. Yo. I saw a trailer. In fact, I saw two. Do you want to talk about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse or Reign of the Superman? Mark, you pick. Where do you want to start? Uh, well, let's uh, go low first. Reign of the Superman. So have either of you guys seen Death of Superman that preceded this? I'm assuming Yeah, because they've been telling the same goddamn story since I've been a sixth grader. So yeah, we've all seen it. We've just seen the different iterations of it okay but did you see the movie this is directly a sequel of no okay i'm assuming mark you didn't either no i do have the um bagged chrome foil uh cover comic from the the 90s that i'm sure is going to increase in value and eventually pay for my retirement um i think you're closing in on a buck 27 in the next few years so that's an investment right there that's but no i have not seen the actual movie okay so We'll start. We'll start with Maya because I, I have a feeling you have some strong opinions. You watch this trailer. What do you think of this movie? I don't like it. Um, like I said, you know. First of all, you know what my favorite part about Superman is Superman, and he's not really in this movie. Not showing him. So that's the first problem. And like I said, they tell the same damn story over and over again from the time that I was a sixth grader in Palmdale, California. It wasn't even that good of a story the first time. It's a gimmick out of a gimmick, and they keep doing it over and over again. It's lame. I don't like the animation. And I don't like DC long trying to be like, you know, getting away from the Bruce Tim era stuff and coming with this, you know, like edgy, it's just bullshit. And I hate, I hate the way that they went. That, that's what really ripped me out of liking DC is with the choices that they made with the animated movies. And this is right up that alley. So true to form. And this is just how they roll. I hate it. Mark, what do you think of it? I, I just find it, it's really curious that out of the wealth of, stories that DC has to pull from 
um, especially when you're getting into the movies and you can do kind of else world stories that this is the one you go with. I, I don't know anybody who remembers this story really fondly. And I don't understand that there'd be a big demand for mm-hmm. retelling this in a different format. So more than anything else, I was just perplexed at why this is what you would choose to, mm-hmm. to make a movie out of. I mean, you know, especially when something like Superman Red Sun is just sitting there dying to to be made animated and would be an awesome and is a great story. So, I yeah, I, I mean, I'm certainly not going to see it. The um, In my hate, I went and looked at, like, total DVD sales of these things um, because I wanted to see, like, if it was – if DC animation was still a thing. And really from the Bruce Timm era, it makes you about, you know, about – uh, one half to one sixth the amount of the old stuff that the old stuff used to make but um death of superman made six million so basically if they put batman or superman in it they get a bump with the money and for some reason keep people keep buying this shit see to me this makes total sense as to why you would pick these two storylines this is a direct sequel i did actually rent and watch the death of Superman, which is, it's fine, but that that's not a story. It's two guys punching each other for an hour, and then they punch each other to death simultaneously. So there there isn't a story, which is a, a huge letdown in that overall arc, and that's how the comic is, too. So they were pretty accurate to that. This makes sense to me because it's it's a story people have heard of. Casual people have heard of the death of Superman. That was a massive event when it happened. That was a massive story. It made national news on the you know back when we didn't have 24 hour news stations and you would go to the the in the midwest the 5:30 nightly news they would they talked about this they made jokes about it on Saturday night live and had sketches about the funeral so this is a story people recognize even if they didn't read it themselves and it, the death of superman is a provocative story and this is the the sequel to that so even though i don't think it's a particularly interesting story it makes 100% sense to me why you would go to this, especially if there are more people that feel like you do, Maya, that these have declined in recent years, and this could be a way to draw people in that you may have lost by changing it. And watching this trailer, it it doesn't seem bad to me. It just seems like something. You know, it, it just seems like something that's happening that, no one will remember like you know it'll get some rentals and it'll be forgotten like it's it's just fine in fairness the huh? reign of the superman story was far better than the death of superman the death of superman was like you know a mini arc of like oh you know the hulk is gonna come kick his ass but really what that story was about is looking at the, what would happen in a world without superman and that was more interesting and so i would be more likely to want to watch this than the precursor but not anymore you've taken enough of my money dc I'm going to disagree with you on this, Luke, because a couple points. One, the people who were alive back then to know about the hype about the death of Superman, they're our age now, right? So we would already know, most likely, I mean, we're not new readers at this point. We'd either got sucked into reading comic books in that point in time, or we're not anymore. So we would know if this is a good story or not. So it's not going to pull new readers in at our age. You're really going to be looking to pull in new readers, new consumers, whatnot, from a younger age who aren't even going to remember that particular storyline. So even if you want to do a death of Superman, you don't have to do the same lame story that was done in the 90s because the people who remember that have no affection for it, and the people who are young and could be brought into it don't even know it. Plus, it's freaking Superman, all right? You don't necessarily need a huge, well-known story for the hook. You just put the big red S on the cover, and you're probably already a third of the way there. Well, generally, you do make about a third of the money, you know, for a Superman versus a Batman movie, so you're right on that part. But but I would say that I'm then, you know, maybe I'm the exception or whatever, but I, I bought that comic when it came out and thought it was stupid, and I rented the movie when it came out because it was a story I remembered, and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll check this out and, and go for it. And just the name for those new readers 
is a more provocative, interesting name. The the death of Superman, you know, and the reign of the Superman with these new people, as opposed to Superman Red Sun. I'm not for a minute arguing that Red Sun isn't a significantly better story. But if I just like Superman and I go to the store and I don't know any of these stories and I see death of Superman, Superman, reign of the Superman and Red Sun, just based on that, I'm probably going to pick death of Superman. And I don't think that's an unusual choice for people. But you don't have to do the same Death of Superman story. Just do a new one. Get somebody who can actually write a compelling story and redo it. Reboot it. I mean, Lord knows DC reboots every 20 minutes anyway. So I wonder, too, is this a... I don't think there is a big clattering of people out there going, they did Death of Superman wrong in Dawn of Justice. But could this be a... Hey, we gave you a weird half version of it, so now here's the real version. If you look at the new DC animated universe, they haven't had enough time to build in, build in why a person would actually care about Superman. At least it, from what I've seen so far. And granted, I got off the boat a couple movies back. Okay, but when you look back at the Bruce Tim, when you had the Superman the animated series, and then you had the Justice League seasons, and you had all the movies that came after it, and then when they did Death of Superman, and if you watched all that stuff prior they had built in reasons for you to care about the character here you get a couple movies and then they're just like oh better go back to it so at least then when they were going doing and redoing the story it had some resonance now it's it's lame dude well before we move into into the spider-verse all i'll say is is that no matter what happens in this movie i hope somewhere in the background you just see a shot of batman banging batgirl <laughs> for all you dc fans out there is she in the wheelchair at the time though no. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> Mark, we also saw Into the Spider-Verse. What did, uh, what did this one do for you? Um, well, I'm a little more interested in this one. I, I thought the animation looked a lot crisper, uh, a nice sort of combination of computer animated while still having the feel of being drawn somewhat as opposed to like a Pixar movie, which is clearly just computer. Um, um, I'm not a huge fan of how Marvel has expanded all of the Spider-Men, not because I have any problems with the individual characters that they've spun off and created sequels for, uh, on, on their own in alternate universes. I actually think that they make for interesting characters, interesting stories, but I'm just not a fan of there being more than one Spider-Man. So while I'm a little more excited about this and I am more of a Marvel guy anyway, I'm not really thrilled with the ideas of combining Spider-Mans. I would much rather that they just, you know, kind of do sort of a soft reboot and, Hey, this is a Spider-Man of a different universe. And let's just tell Miles Morales a story as opposed to mixing them together. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It seems like they came up with the idea to have Miles in it, which I think is a great idea. He's great in the comics. And then they wrote the story trying to explain how there can be both a Miles and a Peter Parker. Mm -hmm. And why not just not do that? I mean, clearly Miles is kind of ripped off from the idea of Batman Beyond. So just do the story like Batman Beyond, like where Peter Parker has pretty much hung it up and he you know makes a little cameo, but it's got to be Miles' story. I mean, they're mm -hmm. trying to have their cake and eat it too, and then you throw Gwen in, and it's like these characters deserve their own thing. They don't, they don't need to rely on Peter Parker for it. I mean, if you want to put a cameo in, that's fine, but it just seems like they were trying to like explain it. So, like, we know that we want to have Miles, so now how do we make it make sense to everybody? And like, that's the whole movie, really. Uh, but I am excited. It was fun. It was lighthearted, and um, I did like the animation quite a bit, except except for the at the beginning, like there was like a little intro where it was hard to like even see what was going on. But um, I, I'm much more excited for this than I am for Reign of the Superman, I'll tell you that. So this, this is some of the things I picked up on, and I agree this looks much better than Reign of the Superman, even though I defended it just a few seconds ago. A couple things that jumped out at me that I, I don't like is I think we're reaching a point where being, you know, hanging a lantern and being self-aware of, of what your character is, is getting annoying. I hated the intro part where Peter Parker is talking about how he was a candy bar and he was pajamas and he was all these things. Like, it's not clever anymore to do those things. It's kind of irritating. And I felt like this whole Peter Parker felt 
didn't feel like Peter Parker to me. He felt like Deadpool. He felt like PG mm-hmm. Deadpool, you know, making jokes about the situation and wisecracking and eating fries and all, all this stuff. It didn't feel genuine to me. Um, so I, I went into this concept kind of excited about the whole Spider-Verse thing. I've never really, I've read maybe two Spider-Man comics my whole life. He's not a character that I generally gravitate to. So this concept to me was kind of exciting seeing all the different ones and whatnot. And, and the way that it came out felt kind of cheap to me, which, which brought it down. Um, but I will say that this is the type of Spider-Man movie that my kid will love. Um, and I think from that standpoint, it's going to be a pretty big success. And I'll probably enjoy watching that a lot more than I will enjoy going to see Despicable Me 27 with him as well. But um, I, I feel like from the concept to what I've seen, I feel really let down. Yeah. I guess we should mosey on into other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. So last week, I was really excited, guys, to talk Daredevil. He's one of my favorite comic book characters of all time. As you both know, there's a new season out on Netflix, and true to form, I binged it all, baby. In all honesty, I only really have Netflix for Daredevil, uh, for House of Cards, and for my daughter. In any event, the new season came out, along with the news that Marvel te- the Marvel Television Universe is essentially falling apart. So it seems like a good time to talk about all this stuff. My opinions, it's the strongest season yet. I was very, very happy with the Daredevil season. Kingpin is at his best, and his plan is really fun. It makes things really fun. It makes you think about the characters in a new and fresh way. We talked before on this show how we were both concerned, uh, Luke and I, uh, about the trailer's representation of what Bullseye would be, and I was happy that in the end they took the chances with the character, but they were good chances, and they made him more believable, more grounded, and actually got me to think about Bullseye in a new way, and usually you don't think about Bullseye. He's just kind of like a force. Um, I was happy that they stayed away from Girlfriends in Freezers. Um, that's a problem that Daredevil and lots of comic books have, so that was good. A uh, big focus on religion, which is my favorite part about the character. Tied in great moments of comics like Daredevil Reborn, Foggy running for district attorney. It was really well done. And they had some great fight scenes. The break off from the prison, the fight in the church, the final fight scene between Daredevil, Bullseye, and Kingpin was, was amazing. Um, I thought they did a great job with Vanessa. In fact, she was my favorite part of the season when she comes in at the end it's the full culmination of what the character was hinting towards in the full in the first season and i just thought she was amazing and it was exactly where i wanted that character to go and i felt like that's where she wanted to go the whole time and i love the season i'm really hopeful it doesn't get canceled but it's probably going to along with jessica jones and and it all what did you guys think if you even bothered to watch it i i have a question yes i i didn't see it yet it's actually it's in my queue i intend to watch it eventually but at any point during the season does bullseye kill an old woman with a peanut (laughs) we talked about that while you were out (laughs) that was my favorite part of that movie for me um i i didn't see it either i started i started it for about 10 minutes and it wasn't anything wrong with the show but i got distracted and then i i moved on to other things because other netflix shows have come up that I'm just more interested in. And I enjoyed the first season of Daredevil, but I wasn't blown away by it. And I enjoyed the hell out of the Punisher parts of, of season two and hated the hand parts and electric parts of season two. I don't know if I'll ever get to this. I have been, I've seen more of these Marvel Netflix shows than I think both of you combined. Yep. Uh, the only ones I haven't seen completely is season two of Iron Fist and this new Daredevil. And I think I finally reached a point where I'm I'm not going to see them anymore out of obligation. I'll watch season two of Jessica or three of Jessica Jones because it's my favorite of the Marvel Netflix shows. But I, I think I, I might just skip this one. And it's not really I can't really put my finger on it. It's not the, the show's fault. It's just there's not enough time for me. Like there's other things. This came out. The same time as uh, The Haunting of Hill House, which is much more my wheelhouse and something I loved. And even even that, like I, I read what happens in Daredevil and I went and I watched the prison scene in it. And even the prison scene, which is great. I am not taking away from the prison scene. It's much better than the hallway fight scene in season one 
um, both in how it's staged, just how it looks, and the fact that unlike the season one, it is actually one continuous take, not just an edited together to look like one take. But I had the day before watched episode, I can't remember if it's episodes four or six of uh, The Haunting of Hill House, which is filmed the entire episode as one giant take and it is edited together but it has sections where there's a 17 minute this section is just, this and is the one part that just whatever film we're talking about the longer this is this is how it goes it's just gonna, eventually yeah. it's gonna be one movie it is. that they do in one well, take and then that's gonna be your favorite movie of all time there is that's like your thing it's called rope and it's it's awesome and you should you should check it out it's a hitchcock movie but but I, I found other things that are more my wheelhouse at the same time. And I'm going to get ripped on by both of you. Sure. But I also found another show on Netflix that I am super into right now that has jumped over my wanting to watch Daredevil. And I don't care what you guys say because like what you like and be proud of it. I love The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. I think it's fantastic. I don't know what the fuck that is. It's Sabrina the Teenage Witch. But it is a like horror themed one. Like they murder people and it's really dark and it's chilling and it's. It's the daughter um, of John Hamm on Mad Men, but she is fantastic in it. So I have. So it's like a re- rebooted Sabrina, like with an edge, right? Yes, which so there's it's like DC. Like you didn't like DC when it was the kid version. Now it's got the edge. You like DC, so you didn't like Sabrina. Well, like it's it's Sabrina. Like, no, it's, it's, it's it's well. First off, first off, first did, off. Did you look- let's slow down the uh, the the Melissa Joan Hart Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Yeah, I have a fondness for. Because Harvey is my uh, best friend and roommate from uh, high school and college's stepbrother. Oh, okay. So, no, I don't. He's also my classmate. Your classmate. He's a, it's actually a terrible show. Uh, this is based on a comic. They actually did make a Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which is a more adult comic. But, yeah, I like the version that's pointed at adults. Because I'm an adult. And I like I like horror. And then this is so very the horror themes type thing. But... There's just so much TV right now. And I think as we talked about why these Marvel shows are dying is there's so much superhero content. There's so much content that if you semi like a show, like I semi like Daredevil, finding the time to devote 10 hours to it, I just don't have right now. And that's the problem for me with it. And it's not their fault. It's just it's not the one that resonated with me. I feel the same way about The Flash. I love the Flash TV show, and that's a movie or a, a show like the, the the first the season finale. Of the first season is one of the best episodes of anything I've ever seen. It like left me in tears. Like it was just so flipping well done. And I got five episodes into season two, and I got too busy. Yeah, and it wasn't the show's fault. It wasn't Grant Gustin's fault. He's a phenomenal Flash, and I just got busy. So it sucks, well, but I mean, it's kind of Luke Cage was like that for me too. I also think the problem with the Marvel TV shows is that it's too decompressed and it's too much of one story told over 13 episodes when I think what they really needed to do was lean into the more serial standalone villain of the week, you know, comic book format sort of thing. And if you had a, you know, a, a two episode arc where Luke Cage fights, you know, stilt man. And then you have three episodes where he fights the serpent society or or something like that. I think that would carry through, uh, interest in the seasons a lot more. Whereas right now it's just too much of it. It's not, it's not only that you're investing in watching 10 hours, it's a 10 hour story, which is just too much. And it also creates a problem too, where, if you fall off and you watch, say, three episodes and then you have three to four weeks where you don't keep watching it, well, now you've forgotten what you've watched and you can't just pick it up at episode five because it, you forgot what episode one through four were and you're not going to go back and watch those. And so it's easier to just let it drop. Um, that's what actually happened to me with Game of Thrones. That I watched the first season, I really liked it, and then I didn't have time to follow it up. And by the time I could get back into it, I'd forgotten everything I'd watched and I didn't want to rewatch season one. And so it was just easier to, you know, Hey, there's a new season, Mr. Science Theater 3000 out on Netflix. I'm going to watch that instead. So I, I think that that the, the format isn't helping the Marvel 
TV shows either. And that I think that I that had never occurred to me doing a, a villain of the week type thing, and especially a heroes for hire, you know, eight episode season where mm-hmm. you get both of those characters, and it is more just that that could really work. Yeah, and you too could even I mean, you could, yeah. they are, which is it, it's it's too bad, and I know neither of you guys watched it. Uh, I really, really like the second season of Luke Cage. I think it's really good. Uh, I think like Elfrey Woodard Emmy, you know, good. And it ended in a great way that really wanted me to see season three, which I'm never going to see now or whatever. So yeah, that is, that is too bad. It's too bad that this is the end of the episode, episode 39, if I'm not mistaken, depending on how we're counting these days. 39. Mark, where can they find you? Uh, well, you can find me in downtown Portland or on Twitter at Wink Martindale five. There might be an underscore in there somewhere. I'm not sure. Well, I am at Luke. Definitely an underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L on Twitter. And I'm at Maya Madrid with no underscore, but together we're kids seriously and we're out of here. Bye. See you. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.